Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us today. For those of you I don't know, um, I'm David Haig. I'm the Strategic Advisor at the Money and Pension Service, which is an organisation set up by the government to improve financial wellbeing across the UK. Uh, I'll be facilitating our discussion today and we'll shortly be hearing presentations from Karen Croxon from the FCA, from Fiona Gregg from the JP Morgan Chase Institute, and from Pantley Solomon from the Behavioural Insights team. We'll then have a Q&A session. So um, you'll find at the bottom of your screen, there's a tab saying Q&A. If you'd like to submit questions, um, please do so. Please do submit them throughout the sessions and then we'll pick up as many of those as we can uh, during our Q&A time at the end. So this seminar is the sixth in the Build Back Better series facilitated by the Behavioural Insights team. And the series explores how we can adapt and overcome many of the various challenges posed by, by COVID-19. And as we all know, um, COVID is having a really transformational impact on many different aspects of, of life. Though, as with many things in this world, it impacts on different people and different organisations in, in really different ways. You know, it has a really asymmetric impact. So, to take a couple of examples, if we think about the impact on business, it's very clearly the case that many businesses are really struggling in the face of well, in the face of changing consumer spending habits, many of which are driven by, by lockdown, both national and local. But it's also fair to say that other businesses, of course, particularly those, for example, exposed to online spending, perform strongly. So, so it has a quite a different impact on different businesses, depending on, on kind of how they operate. And that's also true for individuals. If you think about the impact of COVID on personal finances, you know, for many people, what they're seeing at the moment is a falling income and a really volatile income. And that hits them really hard at the same time that you may say, see fairly shortly increases in credit card repayments as, as repayment holidays come to an end. So there's a group of people for whom kind of falling and volatile income coincides with, with rising spending and therefore disposable income taking a really significant hit. But there are other people for whom that's not the case. Actually, their incomes have stayed remarkably stable through this crisis. Um, they've stayed in work, they've, they've stayed working, fully full-time working in work. And actually they're spending on, on travel, on consumables has fallen. And so for some people, you know, the reality is their disposable incomes are probably stronger than they've ever been. So you kind of get this really different impact depending on which groups you're, you're talking about. And it's easy to kind of forget one of those groups, but they're both, both there. And we also, of course, see significant pressures and strains on, on relationships, uh, major changes to the way people are spending their leisure time, and of course, impacts on the way we um, are currently working, our working environments. So reflecting some of those challenges, previous webinars in this series have considered issues such as sustainable transport in a post-lockdown world and changing the world of work for the better. And as, as we've just described, if you've missed earlier webinars, and they are available on the BIT website. Today's seminar will focus on helping people get back on track with their finances. And with that in mind, let me formally introduce our first speaker. So Karen Croxon is the Deputy Chief Economist and Head of Research and Social Data Science at the FCA. She leads an interdisciplinary programme integrating economics, data science and behavioural science to understand markets, design policy and improve FCA internal operations. Prior to joining the FCA, Karen has worked at Quantum Black as an academic economist at Oxford University and as a strategy consultant at McKinsey. And Karen holds a PhD in Game Theory and Applied Econometrics from Oxford and an honorary, professor, an honorary professor in economics at Nottingham. And that certainly makes me feel um, my qualifications don't really stand up uh, to scrutiny. Um, but, but we'll hear from Karen and then Karen will pass back to me and I'll introduce our next um, speaker and we'll go in that mode until we get the Q&A. So with that, with, with that um, in mind, Karen, over to you. Thanks very much, David. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, thanks to uh, the Behavioural Insights team um, for the invitation to join this panel on this important topic today. Um, I think uh, uh, it's a great opportunity to, um, to hear from others. And I think from our side, I just want to spend about 10 minutes just sharing uh, a little perspective and some insights from some of our work uh, on this uh, area. Um, with a focus on on two things really on on what we're doing to understand um, or some of what we're doing to understand how the crisis has impacted uh, household finances, but then secondly also um, how the pandemic 
uh, is impacting consumer behavior and decision making. Um, and we have uh, we, we have quite an interesting program of work on both of those areas. I just want to say as well a quick uh, thank you to um, uh, you know various members of my teams uh, that are involved in this work. I think some of them uh, are on the webinar, Laura Smart, perhaps uh, Flo Farley and a few others. Uh, so thanks very much for, for all of your hard work through the, the, through the pandemic. And there's just a, a few touch points to it here. Um, so uh, if we could click through to the next slide, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, give you a sense for some of this. Uh, and, the, and then the next one again. Sorry about that. Fill a slide. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to talk about is is really just, you know, it's a bit about the financials, financially, how have consumers um, fared in the crisis? Um, and it's it, you'll very much see some of the flavors of these differential impacts, David, that uh, you were just referring to. Um, now, I should preface this by saying that we um, you know, there's no perfect data source for this kind of work. Um, and um, we are at the FCA, the approach we've taken is to, to try to um, triangulate a number of uh, sources of intelligence and, and data on this. Uh, some of them are more recent than others. Uh, there's some particular cuts I'm gonna share with you here are, are sort of dating back to around the summertime. Um, and we're doing some work with some, some slightly more recent data um, at the moment, but I think these give a flavor of some of the contours of um, the impact of the crisis and, and some, of the, uh, some of the kind of considerations, I guess, uh, for all of us and, and certainly from the regulatory perspective. So, so the broad headlines here are sort of, you know, just to call, up, call these out, I think overall what we're seeing is that um, the impact of the crisis so far for, for, for many in the economy has been quite mitigated. And obviously, um, you know, in some cases, that's simply uh, to do with, with uh, and you'll see this in a, in a moment when I give you a sense of some consumer segments uh, being largely unaffected so far. But in many cases, uh, people have been, uh, you know, caught up in the um, economic uh, consequences of the, of the crisis already, but are benefiting from temporary support measures. And obviously a, a very focal one there is the furlough scheme, um, but there's some added uh, cushioning um, from other sources. At the FCA, we've been, uh, we've introduced um, uh, since the start of the crisis, uh, the opportunity to take a break from your payments on things like your mortgages and uh, your consumer credit products. Um, and so this, this, this world that uh, impacted consumers are in, not all of them, but many of them is also one where there's, there's quite a bit of uh, temporary policy support in the environment. Um, and the, uh, you know, uh, nonetheless, you know, it is the case that I think, you know, we're going to see in a minute, uh, you know, visual with the segments, but headline level, we're seeing that there is a, uh, in percentage terms, small, but nonetheless, in absolute terms, quite, uh, quite considerable minority of consumers who have been heavily affected already um, by, uh, you know, either significant earnings loss and or an exit from employment. It might be job loss. It might be um, exiting voluntarily. Um, they, some of these were already financially vulnerable or came into the uh, crisis with low financial um, resilience. We think that's about um, five percent of the population as of about summertime. But, but obviously, you know, as I caveat that heavily with no data source being be, being kind of the definitive view of that. Um, and I think uh, we're seeing another group which uh, which it, you might think of as the newly financially vulnerable um, people who were in uh, quite good shape financially coming into the crisis um, have since experienced, you know, a, a significant economic impact. And um, as of summer, we're now reporting that they um, that, that, that they were struggling financially. And this is, you know, a small uh, group in percentage terms, but, you know, a couple of percent, but we're potentially talking there about a million people. Um, now then, you know, getting under the hood of that, because of course these averages can still mask quite a lot, um, you know, and, and thinking of your point, David, about some of the differential impacts, we can see some quite important and distinct patterns in, uh, the, in, in the demographics uh, among those hardest hit financially and those, those less affected. Uh, so on average, uh, you know, younger cohorts uh, are more caught up in this financially. Um, there are some differences by, um, 
ethnic and racial background, individuals from BAME backgrounds are more likely to have been hit worse financially. And in our data, uh, in this particular data set, we find that that's, uh, that's so regardless of whether they came into the crisis with low financial resilience or not. And we're doing a bit of follow up work to sort of double click on that uh, with some regression analysis and sort of control for various factors there that you would want to control for to understand that better. Um, we see some apparent regional differences. Um, it won't be too surprising, uh, you know, to people kind of following this closely. But uh, for instance, Londoners as of summer had had been more likely to be caught up in the newly vulnerable uh, group. Um, the self-employed are more heavily impacted. And then, of course, some very important, um, and quite a few of these things are correlated, but some very important impacts uh, that are differing by sector of employment or sector of work um, with, for instance, construction, not, you know, not time to kind of go into this in great detail with you and you need to hear from the other speakers, but construction is one example there, um, more likely um, to um, be a sector where the newly financially vulnerable have been employed. Um, and then I think going forward, you know, from this point in time at the summer, what we were seeing was that actually, even in some of the segments um, where uh, people were impacted, but, but cushioned so far or not yet impacted and actually do it, doing fine, you know, some of the people that, that David referred to there may be paying down debts and so on and so forth, um, maybe able fully to carry on working without uh, reduced hours or income or anything. Um, there were there, there there were still some potential vulnerabilities there, and in some cases, in in those groups, there were actually um, people who uh, were still relying on furlough. And of course, you know the uncertainties then uh, going forward in those situations for some of these people, um, whether they will be able to fully bridge the crisis or whether that that vulnerability may be may be more structural for them. Uh, next slide, thanks. And so the, I'll I'll. I'll I'll spend just a moment on this. This is really just sort of showing showing you with a bit, little bit of a visual some of what I was just talking about. So um, how did we get to some of those headlines? Well, what we did is we took, uh, in this particular case, we took Understanding Society, that's the, the world's largest household panel. We took their month, they've been running monthly updates uh, through the uh, COVID crisis uh, with a smaller panel of um, about 13,000 uh, UK individuals. And we we took we've been taking that data on a semi regular basis as one of our data uh, data lenses, and then uh, in this case what we did was we segmented the population. So we did this based on whether you know your status in financial resilience terms coming into the crisis, were you already someone who was relatively vulnerable in that sense or not? Um, how you've been impacted since the crisis began began financially, job loss, earnings loss and significant earnings loss and so on. Um, and then also the individual's own subjected sort, sort of sense of how uh, how worried they were about the future financially in the near term. Um, and we had various measures um, that we we're able to look at there. And then, you know, when you, you know, sparing details again, you know, when you do a cut like that, you sort of get some of the figures you saw on the previous page. So there is a clearly identical group of, of, of fin newly financially vulnerable. So people who, uh, you know, are newly caught up in uh, the economic um, challenges. And um, this group is particularly worried about the future. So on the next page, you know, I'm going to show you, show you that uh, psychological distress, uh, the share of people in this in this group reporting psychological distress is quite high, the highest of the uh, segments and, and followed closely by um, a group that, that were um, with low financial resilience coming into the crisis, but in that have now also been hit hard. So really quite financially vulnerable individuals, um, you know, one in four of these had exited employment uh, as, a, as of uh, the summer. Um, 33% of them were on temporary contracts, more likely to be employed in, in sects like uh, accommodation and food services, some of the customer facing roles. And, um, you know, these are sort of sectors where the crisis impact has, has been quite pronounced. And then there are these segments, you know, there's another segment right at the bottom there, the impacted but cushioned. And so here people have been impacted with, with a combination of earnings loss and or job loss. Um, many of them have been furloughed, one in three, um, caught up in it many ways, but coming into the crisis with more of a cushion and reporting lower levels of, of anxiety for the future and psychological distress, but nonetheless some risks in this segment. And then um, a group that uh, is uh, vulnerable coming into the crisis, you know, on benefits, perhaps um, uh, low earners, but in unaffected sectors, 
remains financially vulnerable, but not particularly um, off the back of this pandemic uh, so far, you know, looking back uh, as things were in the summer. Um, and then and then there is a, a, a group that's quite large. It's about two thirds of the population, you know, in this data set uh, in the summer. And this group we, we call doing well or doing fine. You know, this is a group where so far um, the um, financial or economic impacts of the crisis have not been binding for this group, have not resulted in, in, in any kind of new vulnerability. Um, but even within this group, you know, we see you know, a good number of people on furlough. It's actually because of the size of the segment, it's the largest absolute number on furlough in this group, about 2.5 million people. And so clearly some potential uh, risks uh, in, within this group as well. Uh, next slide, thanks. And, and here, you know, this is uh, so this was getting under the skin again of some of the differential impacts um, by by um, uh, demographics, uh, looking at uh, things like sort of age, ethnicity and race, um, whether people um, were coming into the crisis, you know, with particular uh, vulnerabilities on the financial side. And so you see, um, you know, I, I, I won't repeat the headlines here, but, um, you know, I'll just kind of remind you of some of the differences, younger on average, more likely to be working at affected sectors, um, more likely to come from BAME backgrounds on average if you're caught up in either of the two most uh, impacted and vulnerable going forward groups. Uh, next slide, thanks. And then I mentioned that, uh, you know, as, as just one of the mechanisms of support for, for people out there, um, we at the FCA have introduced uh, temporary um, payment deferrals for mortgages and consumer credit products. Um, and we've seen, you know, we've, we've seen quite substantial take up of these. Um, and um, uh, what we what we tend to see there is, again, you know, there are some patterns, perhaps un, unsurprising, given what I've just told you about the population and, and sort of the way the impact has has landed across the population, some patterns here in the utilization of these support mechanisms. So use, users have tended uh, to be um, younger, They've tended to be, uh, you know, uh, or more likely to have come from um, BAME backgrounds. Next slide, thanks. Um, they're also more likely, you know, again, unsurprising to have entered the crisis with low um, financial resilience on various measures uh, and to have suffered some kind of um, earnings loss or, or, you know, severe financial shock uh, so far in the crisis. Thanks. Next slide. Um, and then this is a bit, you know, a bit of a, a forward look about some of the some of the challenges uh, sort of bleeds into, uh, I guess, a little bit of a picture about coping mechanisms as well. But when we look forward, you know, as of the summer, um, uh, oh, actually, this was sort of late, late summer, autumn. What we saw was that really many, many individuals and families out there um, braced for quite tough times ahead, expecting to cut back on non-essentials, but also essentials in many cases, um, expecting to need to um, borrow from friends and family to try to get access to credit uh, from a lender, um, you know, a, a substantial minority um, expecting to need to seek debt advice um, and, and, and also, um, you know, in, in some cases to um, be using a food bank. So quite a challenging uh, picture for many people out there. And then, um, and then finally, just give you a flavor for this, for this sort of branch of the work, some of the next steps uh, and, and next moves on our side. Um, and the, this is really just a, a glimpse, there's quite a bit going on. We're gonna be continuing to track consumers and their finances uh, and, the, and the, the picture there through the recovery. We've got various kind of uh, more updated work uh, that we're looking at at the moment. Um, but we're also going to be doing deep dives and have begun some of these deep dives on particular uh, consumer subgroups um, with a particular eye on, on diversity and inclusion and, and, and some of the differential um, impacts and trying to understand them um, better and think about coping mechanisms and our role as a regulator. Um, we're also doing quite a bit of work to link this to this, this insight to kind of dimensions of broader vulnerability. So thinking about health, mental health, and some of the other, uh, some of the other life factors um, as well that impact people and understanding as I say you know coping mechanisms because really for us it's about it's about the um, what can we what is our part in this as regulators um, how can we understand enough to make sure that the support we're providing uh, is helping uh, understand that it is helping and tweak it if it's not and understand what further uh, support um, we can be providing or, or help others understand that picture.
So that's kind of the first, you know, the, the first branch I just wanted to talk, talk about. And then just, just to finish, I wanted to touch on, um, if you could move on just uh, a slide or two. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, to touch on on our work to understand, which is a bit more the behavioral science side of things, that, to understand the way the crisis is impacting our behavior as consumers, um, decision making and some of the potential implications for, for us and others in the policy space. So here, some of the work we've been doing, you know, we, we uh, began... Uh, one of the strands we began with was an external literature review. You know, what could you learn from past crises in this regard? What what has the literature had to say on that? And then another more empirical, uh, you know, um, piece of research is that we have uh, we we quickly ran an online um, an online survey to try to get a read uh, more directly on people's situations, but at the same time look at their get a scientific read on on their biases in various ways and capability and all with a view to being able to do a behavioral segmentation um, as a complement to the previous segmentation. If you could just uh, click on one for me, thanks so much. Um, so I'll talk about that again in a moment, but just the insights from the literature review, I think there's some just some interesting kind of takeaways that we've taken in some of our work. Um, obviously there's an opportunity here uh, and I know, you know, the Behavioral Insights team is ob obviously very, um, very involved in, in this space and probably many others on this webinar. Um, but some of the insights there we, that are um, potentially important and actionable, um, the power of social norms in this context. So there's some evidence from past crises that um, stigma associated with things like debt and indebtedness actually could could go down because you feel that actually this, uh, you know, this, these problems that you're facing are not really at your own hand. You know, this is this is kind of symptomatic of a wider challenge that is really troubling you know, uh, the, the the world's kind of largest countries and governments. And so when um, we're all in this together to a certain extent, um, there's something I think that we picked up in the literature about um, the importance to people in a time like this of feeling that institutions um, you know, really have the back of consumers and the population at large and citizens and, and are not out to exploit this um, and, and um, heightened sensitivity to that. So people looking really to kind of put their put their um, uh, give their business to institutions that they really feel are doing the right thing um, and pulling together for the greater good in the time of a crisis. Um, and and then finally, uh, a lot of people out there very, very maxed out, um, struggling with mental scarcity and 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 kind of limited cognitive uh, bandwidth in this time. And so keeping things as simple as possible, um, you know, when we're looking for that engagement from consumers or helping firms to be doing that uh, is very important. And then, of course, in this world with so much uh, home working now for um, people or staying at home, if you're not working under lockdown uh, scenarios, then digital uh, digital has a role. To, you know, it's not a panacea, but it clearly has a elevated role to play for many. Um, next slide. Thanks. So then just to touch, uh, just to, to, to complete the picture in a minute or so, um, we've been developing this behavioral segmentation. We think this is work, uh, quite, it's quite early stage work for us. Um, we are leveraging here off um, some of the work by Stango and Zimmerman over in the US context um, where they uh, uh, did a behavioral segmentation, found that um, there's some pretty good evidence that um, there's, we're all biased to some extent. There's heterogeneity, though, in the population. That's quite interesting. And um, there's quite a lot of intrapersonal sort of persistence in that. So these, these measures of, of, of how biased people are and the way they're biased are, are quite persistent over time. Um, we're interested in whether whether that, you know, whether we can kind of get a, a, a read on that for the UK population and whether that ultimately could be actionable um, to help people. Um, would it help us predict who is most behaviorally vulnerable to exploitation, for instance? That can be something you worry more about, uh, always worry about, but worry more about in a, in a, in a situation like this. Um, and um, can we identify markets with the biggest sort of conceptual or underlying, uh, you know, potential for harm? Could we then, you know, use all of this uh, in an action oriented way to try to get interventions uh, to people in situations in a timely, effective way? Uh, next slide. Um, I'll skip over this one, but that's the heterogeneity I talked about. So we've all got biases. Um, that was just a simple count of the biases and then the share of people with them. We at the FCA take a quite a we take a view of vulnerability where there are sort of four key drivers. Um, you know, one is is your health. Uh, other another driver is life uh, important life events. 
um, your um, your resilience, which can include your financial resilience, and then your capability. So in this context, it would be capability for making what can be in the best of times quite complex uh, um, financial decisions and a lot of certainty with with quite high stakes. So quite quite a an important but challenging decision environment. Um, and we see a correlation between our behavioral uh, behavioral biased measure measures of behavioral biasness and these other uh, dimensions of vulnerability. And then interestingly, you know, when we control for um, for those other drivers, what we find is that there's something predictive. Uh, that's coming through about what you might call the B count um, or the, you know, the, the count of biases in the population. And it's associated with increases in the likelihood of suffering, uh, suffering on a financial front, struggling with bills and credit commitments and needing to use credit uh, in the pandemic um, amongst those that are, are, are borrowers and um, reporting a need to be using, uh, you know, credit in the next six months. So people who are in some challenging situation and reaching out for coping mechanisms. Um, we think this is interesting. If you if you could just go to my last slide, I think. I think perfect. Um, and we think this is interesting and we are, it's early stage, but we're exploring ways that we could make that um, impactful, um, potentially from a consumer protection policy point of view. Thanks very much, David. Karen, thank you so much. What an insightful and thought-provoking presentation and the questions are starting to come in. So, um, so be ready for those before too long. Um, so let me introduce our next speaker, which is, is Fiona Gregg, who is a Managing Director um, and the Director of Consumer Research at JP Morgan Chase Institute, uh, which delivers data-rich analysis and expert insights for the public good. Fiona joined the Institute in 2014 after serving as the Deputy Budget Director for the City of Philadelphia for two years. From 2007 to 2012, Fiona was a consultant for McKinsey and Company, where she consulted public and social sector clients on strategy, operations and economic development. In 2009, Fiona started and ran Bank on DC, a financial inclusion programme for the District of Columbia. Uh, Fiona, we're in your, your very capable hands. Great. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. Um, I'm gonna be presenting on a, a, a couple of different papers, actually, if you advance to the next slide, but just wanna convey that these are the views of my own and not necessarily JP Morgan Chase. Um, so first of all, we've been doing a bunch of work trying to understand what's going on with health, household finances through the pandemic, and also trying to understand the impact of some of the government support programs that have um, been you know, dispensed through the CARES Act that was authorized in March. Um, and all of this work is, is collaborative with some academic uh, colleagues in, you know, University of Chicago and beyond. Um, but I want to emphasize that the data that we're using for this work is administrative data. So probably unlike the work that Karen was describing, which sounded to me a lot like survey responses, these are transactions that we're observing in people's bank accounts, primarily their checking accounts or so their primary, you know, account that they use on a day to day basis. And so we have very large samples that span the US um, and uh, are, are, are representative of actually the entire income distribution. So one thing that's pretty important in terms of context, I don't think this is uh, unique to the United States, but certainly the job losses have been concentrated among low income families and have been disproportionately high among black and Hispanic workers um, where the unemployment, for whom the unemployment rate peaked the most and has fallen most slowly. Um, on the next slide, I'm gonna just explore what has happened to the spending of families. And here we're looking at year over year percent change in debit card spending um, by income quartile with the lightest blue line representing the lowest income quartile. So it's kind of surprising that on the prior slide I showed you that job losses accrued the most to low income families. And yet here I'm showing that everybody's spending dropped dramatically right when the national emergency was declared and in April it was down by 30 to 40%. But since then actually the spending of low income families has recovered more quickly than the spending of high income families. On the next slide, I'm gonna cut this by industry of employment. So we look at their, where they worked back in February and the, I just want you to focus on two lines here, the purple line and the blue line. So the purple line, these are people who worked in grocery stores, drug stores, discount stores. These, these, these workers kept going to work, right? Those grocery stores remained open. If anything, they were busier than ever. 
And we see that the spending of these workers in, um, recovered most quickly. Indeed, they may have been spending more because they may have been going to work more, spending long hours <laughs> at work, may have been earning more. The blue line though is pretty interesting because th these are workers who are working in clothing and department stores. These are, these are jobs that very likely were furloughed or lost entirely. And you can see it's interesting that their spending is also increasing quite, um, uh, recovering quite quickly. So we start to think that this may have something to do with the government supports that they were receiving. On this slide, I'm showing you balances in those checking accounts and on the left by income quartile. On the left, I'm showing you levels. And, um, and on the right, I'm showing you a year over year percent change. And sure enough, we actually see that the balances of low income families increased the most. Um, around the time that the economic impact payments were made, right? So the U.S. did a couple of important things. Um, in April, by April 15th, they had actually dispensed um, uh, stimulus payments of roughly $1,200 for a single person, $2,400 for a double, for a, a, a couple, and then additional $500 for every additional child um, to families earning under $100,000. So this, this was almost universal almost everybody got this payment. And you can see right by that second vertical line that balances are shooting up, um, most notably for low-income families, largely because this is certainly so somewhat mechanical, right? They start with much lower balances. A $1,200 check is a much larger percentage increase when you're starting from $2,000 than if you're starting from $4,000. Okay, let's go to the next slide and I'm gonna show you this cut again by industry of employment. Because what's notable here is that, again, focus just on the blue and the purple lines. Everybody gets that check and um, you know, it, it causes a surge in their balances right around April 15th. But, but pay attention to the blue line. These are people who lost their jobs and um, likely started to receive unemployment benefits after that. And their balances are, are actually surging past the arrival of that economic impact payment. Okay. On the next slide, so this is starting to tell us kind of an interesting, almost a paradox, right? We see that as I, when I first showed you, um, job losses were most concentrated among low-income families. You see that in the, in, the, in the percent change in labor income that's reflected in the light blue bars, where the, we see the largest cuts in income to low-income families. At the same time, we're seeing the fastest recovery of spending among low-income families. That's the orange bars. But when we include government supports in the total income picture, we actually see that income has increased the most for low-income families in a way that that now starts to explain the spending recovery. Okay, so in the main, remaining couple pages, I'm gonna tell you about those government support programs. Um, there were three key things that the US government did in the CARES Act. Um, number one, it dispensed these economic impact payments. I told you about them, roughly $1,200 to $2,400 per, per family. Most people receive these. And the, the chart here is showing the cumulative outlays by the federal government over time. The green is those economic impact payments. And you can see that by the Have we lost Fiona? Um, Cameron or Alistair, do you want to um, send her a quick message just to let her know that it looks like we lost her based on her Wi-Fi? We'll do, Ashley. Do you want to move on? Sorry for that. Am I back now? Okay, great. Okay. So um, all to say the unemployment um, benefit program was a dramatic increase uh, in, in, in kind of the level of support that jobless workers were receiving. The third thing they did was to offer forbearance in, uh, against a couple of different loan programs, but I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm gonna talk less about that. On the next slide, I'll just illustrate to you uh, just how important the, this unemployment um, program became as a share of total income. It had never before um, spiked above, barely budged above 1% of total income. But as of the end of June, um, uh, this benefit had represented 7% of total income. So, and that's because of the higher benefit levels, it's because of the high unemployment levels, obviously, but it's also because of the expansion in the eligibility of this program. Okay, 
next slide, I wanna to start to tell you what impact this had on people. Now, before I do so, I'm just gonna show you a quick picture of what this looks like um, for families pre-pandemic. So before they, that uh, em employment unemployment benefit was increased by $600, we normally saw that spending drops among families who lose their job. Um, this is an event study showing you the change in spending among families when they lose a job and they receive unemployment insurance benefits in month zero. And you can see that spending drops to the tune of sort of eight to 12%, depending on what group you're part of. White families cut their spending by less, black and Hispanic families, they cut their spending more. And that's largely because they, they, they come into job loss with lower, less of a cash buffer to begin with, right? So remember, spending normally drops when people lose their job. Okay, on the next slide, I'm showing you what happened to the spending of jobless workers in the, in the pandemic. And I'm comparing those who, in orange, who received these benefits, who lost their job and received these benefits versus in blue, the group of people who we didn't see receive these benefits and we infer that they remained employed. And you can see that the orange line, first of all, drops more precipitously, right? Jobless workers, when they lost their job, they, dropped, they cut their spending a whole lot more than the employed. Um, However, as soon as they start to receive those benefits in, in week zero, their spending is increasing a lot. And indeed, it actually, uh, it actually increases to an, uh, roughly 10, 12% above their baseline spend level. And that it is because we believe the $600 weekly supplement was causing them to spend more during the pandemic than they had been prior at a time when everybody else's spending was cut dramatically. Um, so this we take as evidence that the unemployment insurance benefits weren't just sort of um, helping to insure against so idiosyncratic hardship, but it was actually boosting aggregate spend. Okay, next slide. Um, uh, this very quickly, that boost in spend was even greater for low income families. This is the orange line versus high income, higher income workers for whom that benefit increase would have been a, a smaller proportional increase. Um, so it was very progressive in that regard. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Importantly, though, um, I'm not sure what the UK, but <laughs> this is probably less of a UK thing, but um, in, in the US, actually, the, our unemployment benefits are distributed through 53 different state programs. And a lot of people experience delays in these benefits being received. Um, and as you can see, here I've cut the data according to, this is a subsample of people who lost their jobs by April 19th, but um, the green line shows people who received their benefits by end of March, blue is received benefits by end of April, orange is received benefits by the end of May. So they all lost their job at roughly the same time, but the orange families had to wait a lot longer for those benefits to show up than the green family. And you can see that their spending is ticking down with each passing week as they're having to wait for those benefits to arrive. I think this tells us, this teaches us two things. Number one, the cost of delay for families, right? In terms of the hardship that they experience when they don't receive those benefits. But it also tells us something about um, the impact of that, those eligibility expansions, right? These, are, these could be workers. This is what the spending of families would have looked like had they not become newly eligible as a result of the changes in the, the programs to the CARES Act. Okay, next slide. This is my uh, last empirical slide, which is just to show in, um, in July, the 600, at the end of the July, um, the $600 supplement expired and families stopped receiving that extra $600 boost. They started receiving the, the more standard state benefit level. And what you can see in the top plot is the spending in blue um, of these benefit recipients starts to fall. It falls by about 14% in the month of August relative to, to, to July. So right when these benefits you know, expire, their spending starts to drop. This, the bottom plot also shows, sorry, um, what happened to their liquid benefits, their liquid assets. So between March and July, you can see that their liquid assets are actually doubling. Um, over that time frame. So even though their spending is elevated, evidently they weren't spending all of those benefits and they are starting to accumulate savings. Um, and this is consistent with the story I told you at the beginning where you know those workers who were in department store in, um, industries and things like that, where we saw lots of job losses, their, their um, liquid assets were uh, continuing to increase. We see it very clearly here where um, 
over this time frame when families are receiving these benefits, their their savings are, are accumulating. Um, however, in July, we see that they they spent down roughly two thirds of the additional buffer that they had accumulated over the prior four months. So. Um, this is, I think, evidence that just tells us how important the government stimulus has been in terms of boosting not just the spending, but also the savings of low-income families in particular. And I'll conclude on the, and on the last slide, um, just in terms of, you know, that those government supports are really important. Obviously, we haven't really seen um, any additional rounds of stimulus and um, we're now, Entering perhaps a lame duck episode in our in our congressional agenda, so I'm not sure whether we're going to get any in the next couple of weeks. It may take an, until the new administration comes in for us to really get serious about this. Um, but also, just wanted to um, highlight that you know targeting these income supports to low-income families has been absolutely critical in this time when the job losses have have accrued most um, notably to low-income families. Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you. That was, that was brilliant. Some really, really interesting analysis. It's some that's kind of initially counterintuitive, and then when you explain it, it kind of all, all makes sense. So brilliant to see. Um, okay, let's move on to our final speaker, who is Pantley Solomon, who is the Head of Effective and Inclusive Markets at BIT. Uh, his team cover the work on consumer and competition policy, financial behaviour and markets, and energy and sustainability. Hanselis was previously BIT's head of evaluation, where he oversaw the design and analysis of randomized control trials uh, across a number of policy areas, including education, health, crime, international development, consumer behavior, and financial services. Prior to joining BIT, Hanselis worked as an economic consultant in regulation and competition, and as a researcher at the World Bank's poverty reduction and social risk management teams. Pantelis holds a PhD in economics from Brown University in the US. And Pantelis, if I can hand over to you, and if you can keep to a fairly strict 10 minutes, then we've got some time at the end for questions which are starting to come in through the Q&A time. Over to you. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks very much, David. And it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to, to be here. And uh, so um, Fiona and Karen uh, talked about uh, kind of the impact of the crisis on the, kind of, on the financial behavior and, and, and well-being and some incredibly insightful analysis. And what, I, what I'd like to do now is, is kind of talk a little bit about how uh, financial innovation can actually help people develop um, tools to, um, to help them kind of cope with the, with the crisis. So I'd like to first start with, um, so next slide, please. Uh, first start with, um, Thinking about you know you know the, what is a crisis. So uh, there's a kind of a useful definition which I uh, find in kind of well, crisis theory, and um, it, it defines crisis as a as a threat to homeostasis or baseline functioning, where an individual's equilibrium and normal and familiar coping mechanisms are overwhelmed by the circumstances. So a person will either adapt to, at this point, develop new coping skills, or decompensate to to a level, lower level of, of functioning. So there's kind of two things that I take from this definition which I find useful. The first is that the crisis overwhelms your standard coping mechanism, which means that you need to develop new ones if, 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 you, if you want to cope with it. And, and the second is that if you don't adapt to the new circumstances, then, and, and you become kind of worse off, you can actually become worse off for the, for the long term. In other words, you can, you know, we can actually create a situation where some people are, are becoming kind of, um, they move to a new equilibrium, they move to a new situation in the long term. So, so in order to, to kind of help people uh, cope, we can, uh, there's, there's kind of the standard, policy, standard tools of policy and regulation, but also there's, there's financial innovation. So there's, there's kind of financial products that we can, we can design in order to, to do that. So today I'd like to talk to you about our own financial innovation product with, uh, project with the, with the Money and Pension Service and explain how kind of some of the ideas we, we're testing uh, can help people cope with the income of the, the, the impact of the pandemic and, and help them uh, build uh, financial resilience. So next slide, please. So the, so the, the Financial Capability Lab is the, our partnership with the, with, the, uh, with the Money and Pension Service, which aims to design and test innovative ideas to help people make the most out of their money and the pension. So, so we, we've, we've uh, focused on three, three objectives. So first, how can we encourage people to build a savings buffer to withstand financial shock? So um, obviously this has been, uh, quite important now. We can see a lot of people dipping into their savings, and and, and people agree that keeping an emergency, you know, emergency fund is important 
but far fewer actually uh, do that. And actually before COVID, uh, around 11 million people in the UK had actually less than 100 pounds in savings. So the second objective is to get people to, uh, to encourage people to get financial advice and, and guidance. And this is particularly important now with uh, what Karen called the, the newly financially vulnerable people, because these are people that are potentially facing financial difficulties for the first time in their lives. So getting, the, getting these people to, to get help at the right moment before it's too late is really critical. Then finally, we, we want to help people take control over their spending and, and manage their credit. So, so what we did is in the first phase of the lab, we, we, um, we work with 90 experts in the field to generate ideas and we generated actually 244 ideas in total. Then we narrowed those down to 18 ideas based on their impact, impact and feasibility, then tested those uh, using qualitative research and uh, our, on our online experimentation platform called Predictive. And we're taking now the more promising of those 18 ideas based on those findings, and we're testing them in the field with real customers and, uh, and our partners in the, uh, in the financial services industry. So I'll now talk to you about some of those ideas. So, so the first one is about encouraging people to, to get help. So, so advice and, and guidance can actually help us navigate th through this kind of um, uh, complex financial uh, situation. So, and as I said, this is kind of particularly important for people that have never really used it in the past. So the, what we wanted to do here is we wanted to make signposting to guidance a little bit smarter by using data to identify who can actually benefit from guidance. So what we did, we partnered with the uh, pension provider Royal London, and we first conduct, con conducted a data science exercise in order to identify which customers are predicted to have low income in, in retirement so that we can then encourage them to, 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 to get advice from the, from, the money, from the pensions advisory service. So also in, in response to COVID-19, and this was a, an amendment to the, to the original intervention, we used the opportunity to encourage people to speak to the money advice service, depending on the circumstances. So our, uh, so our interventions, next slide please. Um, so, um, we're testing a number of messages now to, to get people to, um, to encourage people in our target group to take a, a guidance VI letter from their provider. So, so the first group of letter emphasizes that Royal London wants to look out for their members and that the reader might lose out by not taking guidance. And this is based on the principle of reciprocity, the fact that you know, if, if, if people are given something um, if, 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 by, by the provider, for example, they will feel compelled uh, to give something back. So, so the second message is, is uh, called this is meant for you. So that it's, it, it makes effectively the, the communication more personalized. So, so we've often found that if people feel that the communication is intended for them personally, they're more likely to take action. So, so we've also emphasized that it's not too late to take action because sometimes in these cases, people feel that uh, the kind of the, the obstacles are insurmountable and there's no point in, in trying. Um, and the third group is, um, the, the, the customers will receive a letter which encourages them to act now and gives them a planning tool to do so. So obviously this is intended to overcome the kind of the inertia and the inaction that you often see in, 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 in the pension sector. So, and we expect to have results for this trial in the next few months. So the, the next trial is, is, with, um, is our partnership with the challenger back Monzo. Um, so what we wanted to do here is develop a, a budgeting tool to help people manage their spending. So what we see is that behavioral biases and environmental factors can often lead many people to spend more than they have or more than, more than their budget is. So um, Richard Thaler um, says that we, we all have a kind of a planner self and a doer self inside us. So the planner self thinks about the future and what's good for us in the future and the doer self cares about what, it, what the here and now. And, that it, and, the, and this kind of dichotomy between this kind of two selves is one of the the reason is why people sometimes have, it, have a hard time um, kind of resisting impulse spending. And, and in fact, the, um, uh, the average um, UK uh, card owner um, has more than 72 pounds per month that they don't really know where they spend it on. So what we did is we, we, we teamed up with Monzo to, to create uh, the spending block, which is a tool to allow customers to block purchases with particular merchants in order to control their spending. So, so this is effectively going to be a feature in the, in the Monzo app that people will be able to, 
to select and use and block a particular merchant by looking at their past transactions. So the uh, so next slide, please. Um, so the, the blog is the first part of the intervention. Then, so, and then once the user selects which merchant to block, they are then asked to write a reminder to themselves explaining why they set the blog. So the reminder, for example, could be something like, uh, you know, remember the holiday that you, you've been saving up for, for example. Then once everything is set up, if the user attempts to, to make a purchase with a, with a blog merchant, the transaction will be declined and a message will explain that the merchant is blocked. Then the customer can actually unblock the merchant, but if they try to do that, uh, the message they wrote to themselves will pop up. And the, the idea here is that kind of the block and the reminder is what we call a soft friction. And, and the use of the, the kind of this soft friction is motivated by the research which shows that even soft commitment devices associated with associated with kind of minor uh, psychological losses, like in this case, kind of this message to yourself, this can have a positive impact on behavior. And, and the, the idea here is that people derive satisfaction from being consistent between their intentions and their actions. So if I promise something, I want to follow up with that promise. And that's particularly true if the promise is written down or made to, to other people. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the third challenge we're trying to address is, is that of managing short-term credit. So the, the FCA has found that around one in 10 of credit card um, accounts take more than 10 years to pay, pay off their balance, which is a long, long time. And a lot of these customers are actually making just a minimum payment every month. And I mean, there's obviously structural reasons be behind this, but the FCA has also identified a number of behavioral reasons uh, which kind of lead to overborrowing and underpayment, uh, such as kind of optimism bias or the anchoring effect of the minimum repayment amounts. So, so what researchers and, and unregulators like the FCA have tried to do um, to increase the amount of people pay each month is to either increase the minimum, minimum payment or removing it altogether. So the results from that, some of these efforts have been mixed. And I think part of the reason here is that there's so much you can do with a static credit card statement that, that, comes, that comes to the, the, the customer once a month. So what we're trying to do here is design a more interactive interface, which will help customers understand the impact of changing their payments in, in real time, both in terms of interest charges that they pay, but also in terms of how much, how much faster they can, they can pay their balance. So we're now working with a, with a major credit card provider to apply the, the interface on, the, on their app so that when people go to pay back their, their credit card, they can use this interactive tool to increase their payment. So, so the intervention has been very successful in our earlier testing on, on the online experimentation. So it's a very, very promising intervention, but also when we, had, when we did some early user testing with our, with our partner, the credit card provider, um, the users found it uh, very useful. And many of them are actually quite shocked by how much they, they can save um, in, in, interest, in interest charges by just increasing their payment even by a little bit. So finally, the, the last project I wanted to talk to you about is a project to encourage people to save through a payroll savings scheme. So, so first of all, what, why savings? I mean, so there's obviously obvious reasons why, why one should save and in that, you know, savings provide a protection for a, um, for, a, for a rainy day savings, which is obviously quite important and uh, especially in, in, in times like this. However, there's, there's also compelling evidence that people who develop a savings habit are more likely to display other types of behaviors that we associate with kind of good practice, good financial well-being. For example, people are more prudent with their spending if they're saving more. So actually building a savings habit is more valuable than just the monetary value of, 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 the, pot, of the pot itself. Now, why payroll savings? So payroll savings is effectively kind of a, an automatic um, uh, transfer from your paycheck direct to, to, to a savings account. And the, the idea here is that this is based on kind of two principles from, from behavioral science. So the first is uh, the notion of kind of um, uh, present bias. So, so people are not willing to sacrifice too much of their current consumption for a benefit that will materialize in the future effectively. So, so in other words, people are not, Sometimes they're not willing to save now for things that for, for, for the future. So what we can do though, though is that you, people are happy to commit to sacrifice that what will happen in the future. 
So if we can get people to pre-commit to a savings contribution that would happen, say, in their future paychecks that we're facing three months' time, they're more likely to do that rather than start saving now. So and this is what we're trying to do here. And the second principle is that of kind of the principle of inertia, which is basically that people tend to stick with the default rather than make an active choice. So if once the people start, so if the contributions can be automated, once people start with them, they're more likely to carry on with them rather than, rather than stop. So, so next slide, please. So we partnered with uh, Capita, the, the professional servicemen and the FinTech startup level for introducing a new personal finance app to their entire workforce, which is about 45,000 people. And as part of their app, they're offering a payroll savings scheme, which will allow employees to transfer funds from their monthly salary to a savings account. So in the first phase of the project, we will work together to increase the uptake of the program because the, even though this is an excellent product and people will say so, the uptake of some of this program has been disappointingly low. It's, it's actually something like le less than 10%. So we, we're trying to increase that. And, and once we do that, once we get people saving, then we want to test additional features to increase their contributions and discourage them to, kind of to, to withdraw uh, impulsively. So for example, one of the ideas we're, we're exploring is to get users to visualize their goals in order to drive the kind of inner motivation and reinforce commitments. For example, uh, having a picture of that holiday that they're planning for in the app with a picture becoming maybe more bright as they get closer to the target can actually help to kind of visualize and internalize the target. And, and this insight is based on a study in, in India which found that workers who were paid in cash saved more when part of their wages was put in an envelope earmarked for savings. But when actually, when uh, that petitioning was even more effective when the, when the envelopes have picture of the children, of the, of the workers' children on them so that they actually had to tear the picture of their children in order to get the money. So, so I'd like to end so, um, the, the talk by saying that um, the, the lab, the Financial Capability Lab is just the beginning and that we have many, many more ideas that we would like to test. So if you're, a, if you're a financial service provider and you're interested in designing and testing innovative interventions to help your customers, particularly during this time, please let us know. Thank you very much. That's it's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so as a result of some predictably poor chairing from me, we've now just got a minute or two for questions. So we're going to do the really, really rapid fire questions of ones I've written down. Um, Fiona, we'll start with you if that's okay. Uh, if a further stimulus package was released, how might you expect spending behaviors to respond, particularly amongst low income families? Yeah, I think I, um, I would expect that spending be continued to be boosted but uh, for low-income families if there is another round of stimulus I do think that has boosted families spending um, and you know a lot of this though depends on sort of what will happen with the job market we you know we are seeing jobs come back but uh, the unemployment rate especially among black families is still in double digits and so um, you know that kind of stimulus really helps to boost the spending, particularly in, in segments of the labor market that are still very soft. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, now, Karen, over to you. A question about whether there's any evidence that you've seen that people who have not been financially impacted are nonetheless deferring payments when they may be better off actually repaying debts. So I guess it's a question about whether you seen any evidence of people maybe taking advantage of the, the, um, the policies in a way we might not have intended. Um, yeah, can you hear me, David? Yeah. Great. Thank, um, thanks for the question. Um, I think it was from Rupert. Um, hi, Rupert. The, um, I think uh, it's a bit early to say definitively. Um, there's there's some evidence, um, you know, so there was take up by people that, um, uh, you know, um, may have been using this on a very precautionary basis. Obviously that, you know, ex ante, you've got to think about the ex ante versus the ex post. So at that point in time, you know, a lot of uncertainty for people um, about the future and, you know, um, uh, and perhaps a sense from many that this, this was an important form of uh, insurance, you know, going forward um, in terms of their cash flows and their needs. So I think we're going to need to, you know, to, to have a little more uh, time pass and evidence accumulate before we can kind of analyze that more definitively. But it's, it's certainly, you know, it's, it's a very good question. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. And, and Pansley, for you, a question which came through around 
Um, building on the work you're doing with FinCap Lab, what, what do you think the future of behavioral science in financial services is? So I think, I mean, if you see how kind of behavioral science has been applied in financial services, we, we started in kind of a simple way by nudging consumers to do the right thing. So see the best example here is the, is a pension to enrollment, which changed the default from an opt-in to an opt-out and had a massive impact. And, you know, we, we then built, we, we then kind of did a lot of work to improve communication of financial institutions with their customers, to improve comprehension and decision-making. And, and if you think about it, there's a lot of progress that's been made. I mean, much of the communication was very poor just a few years ago. Um, and now, as, as, I, as, I, as I showed in, in my, my slides earlier, we're kind of applying uh, behavioral insights to improve product design and the customer journey. And as we can see with our projects with Monzo and Capital and Level, and I think the future here is to create simple products that are easy to use for most people, sort of like the default option, but then also give the option to users to customize them if they want to. So for example, the, you know, the principle here is kind of what we, what, we, what we call the IKEA effect, where users uh, kind of place a higher value on products that they design themselves. And I think moving on to the kind of the next level after we, we, we do that is, is really to encourage companies themselves to, to offer good products to their customers and have kind of market-based mechanisms to do that. And so, you know, if you think about it many times, it's kind of the way that product does design, it, it kind of attracts both kind of what we call naive and more sophisticated customers. So I just kind of giving you the, give, the, the, the kind of the credit card teaser rates as an example. So the, the naive customers will be attracted because of the, uh, of the teaser rates and the lower interest rates at the beginning, but then the sophisticated customers will Will buy the product because they can they can switch once the once the offer expires. So this makes it actually very difficult for a newcomer to offer a good product to enter the market. So I think here it's kind of really an understanding about how small changes in the product design um, can impact the supplier behavior. And I think we, we we should do more work on that. And I think finally I think we we should be ambitious when it comes to kind of some of the bigger societal goals like climate change, and and uh, and and also kind of you know cons um, supplier conduct. You know, we can get people to, you know, in, in invest more in ESG investment using behavioral science, but also improve the corporate culture of, of some of the financial institutions, which obviously was seen as one of the one of the causes of the of the crisis in 2008. Thank you very much. So look, we've come, we've over, we're over, over on our session. There, there's loads of questions come through. But I'm sorry, we haven't got a chance to answer all of them. We've tried to answer um, some of them in the, in the time available. So I think all that's left for me to do is um, is with you. Thank you. So thank you to so much to all the panelists for really amazing presentations um, and being willing to spend the time giving us those, those insights, which has been fantastic. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, sorry we've overrun slightly, but I think it was such a such an interesting session. That hopefully that's okay with people. Um, thank you very much and and goodbye. <laughs>